Uh, we are continuing in our series, Light in a Land of Darkness, a study through the book of Isaiah. Isaiah is very thick. I found, Darren and I have both found ourselves studying a lot more because it's, not, it's just not as easy to understand as some other parts of Scripture. So we are in uh, Isaiah chapter 25 and 26. So last week we were in Isaiah 11 and 12, and so we, will be, we would be in Isaiah for years if we try to go through every, every passage. So we're skipping from 12 all the way to 25. So just a, a quick overview. If you read roughly chapters 13 through 24, it's basically God's judgment on the nations surrounding Israel. So there's a lot of judgment in there. There's a lot of hope mixed in there. So we are picking up in, a, in chapter 25. And so I'm going to read and then pray. So I'll read a chunk of 25, then I'll get into 26, and then I've got to skip to a couple of places because, like I said, we, we can only hit the, the highlights. So I want to draw out the main ideas. So Isaiah 25, verse 1 through 9, says this, O Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will praise your name. For you have done wonderful things, plans formed of old, faithful and sure. For you have made the city a heap, the fortified city a ruin. The foreigner's palace is a city no more. It will never be rebuilt. Therefore, strong peoples will glorify you. Cities of ruthless nations will fear you. For you have been a stronghold to the poor, a stronghold to the needy in his distress, a shelter from the storm and a shade from the heat. For the breath of the ruthless is like a storm against a wall, like heat in a dry place. You subdue the noise of the foreigners as heat by the shade of a cloud, so the song of the ruthless is put down. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Now skip down to chapter 26, verse 1. In that day, this song will be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. He sets up salvation as walls and bulwarks. Open the gates that the righteous nation that keeps faith may enter in. You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever for the Lord God is an everlasting rock. Now down to verse 9. Isaiah says, My soul yearns for you in the night. My spirit within me earnestly seeks you. For when your judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world learn righteousness. Then down to verse 19 of chapter 26. Your dead shall live, their bodies shall rise. You who dwell in the dust... Awake and sing for joy, for your dew is the dew of light, and the earth will give birth to the dead. Let's pray. God, I thank you for this passage, and I pray that you would bring clarity to it, because I think when we first fly over it, it's, we don't understand what's happening, and I pray that you would uh, give us understanding to see that these things were written to Israel in a time and a place, and the people who were in pain and suffering from the nations around them, and even from the judgments of God from the, as a consequence of the sin that they had brought upon the consequences they had brought upon themselves because of their own sin. And Lord, there is much pain in our lives, and I pray that this morning that you would help us to receive your word for us today and that you would put hope in our hearts through this message because um, no one here can put hope in another person's heart. But the word does tell us in Romans 15 that it is the Holy Spirit who can cause our hearts to abound in hope. And so Holy Spirit, would you come and would you speak to us? Would you open our minds and our hearts that we might receive the truth that you have for us? And especially those for, for who, are, who are feeling pain in their lives, God, that you would um, give them something to cling to and instruct them, teach them, teach us, God. Make it clear to us what you want us to, to hear this morning and what you want us to do in response to this message. So I ask for your help in teaching this. We ask for your help in being obedient and responding to, to what you reveal to us today. Give us ears to hear, we pray, for your glory. In Christ's name, amen. As I read through this passage and I thought through it, I thought about this. Have you, have you wondered or seen or noticed how much Americans hate waiting? Like for anything. We hate, we hate waiting. When I'm at the grocery store, I look at the lines, there's like, and say for there's like one checker and there's like 20 people in line. I almost always go to self-checkout. Even if it'll take me longer because I don't want to wait in line. I don't like waiting. So if I feel like I'm productive and then I get into the line and I realize it's actually going to take me a lot longer because I don't know the codes and I'm looking up all the codes for the produce, the vegetables, and the fruit, right? And, 
And then I'll take my, if you ever do self-checkout, you, you put your stuff in the bag and you think you're making progress and it's like, please remove item from the bagging area. It's like, what? There's something off on the way. So I take it out. I try to do it again. And it's like, please wait for assistance. Negating the very reason that I'm in the self-checkout line, right? Or you go to Costco. What do you do at Costco when you see the lines? What's the first thing you do? You look for the shortest line. And if there's two that look roughly the same line, what do you do? You start looking at what's in people's carts. You're like, that lady is going shopping for the next four weeks and her cart's this high. That guy has, you know, a bag of dog food that's 50 pounds. So I'm going to get behind that guy. So what I do when I'm at Costco is I, say, I don't want to wait. So I want to figure out which is the most efficient line to get in. And then as I'm in line, you know what I do? I look at the person who would have been in my place, in my second place line, to see if I'm ahead of them. And if I get out ahead of them, then I feel victorious and I feel good. And if they get out ahead of me, I'm like, dang it, I should have stayed in that line. Because we don't like waiting, right? Or think about the DMV. DMV, you all groan because, you know, if when you're in the DMV, sometimes death can seem appealing, right? <laughs> Is this number for execution? I'll take it. My line for, ex for a shooting squad? Okay. Because we don't like to wait. In fact, this is why, because we don't like to wait, this is why a lot of computer applications, I assume this is why they have it, they have a progress bar to tell you how much progress you're making on the loading of something so that you have a sense of how much longer you might have to wait. So for me, a spinning rainbow wheel does nothing for me. Okay, so you're working, but I want to know how much longer am I going to have to wait. And have you noticed that as you wait, uh, time seems to go by a lot more slowly if it's painful or undesirable, and time goes by a lot faster in if life is enjoyable or it's pleasurable or something's fun. So time is, is relative in that sense, right? Your perception of time is relative depending on the kind of experience that you're going through, whether it's painful or whether it's enjoyable. So for me, for example, if I'm, eating, if I'm drinking a Chick-fil-A cookies and cream milkshake, I get to the bottom and I'm like, what? there's no way I'm done with this right now. There's, there's no way. I just, it may have actually taken me five minutes, but it only felt like 10 seconds. Or you contrast that with exercising. You guys, anyone plank? Anyone do the plank for, you know, when you, you put your elbows down? So I'll set a timer on my, on my phone, and I learned I shouldn't put it in front of me because it's just miserable. So I'll, two minutes max, you know, and the seconds just crawl by, especially the last 10 seconds. Has a second ever felt so long to you when, when you're exercising and you're trying to hit that time marker? It's just like excruciating. So the only way that I figured out how to make the planking time go faster is if I drink a milkshake at the same time. So it just, it, it balances out. So your experience of time in waiting is relative to the experience that you're going through. And so the worst kind of waiting is when you're in pain. That's when the time goes by the slowest. And I'm not just talking about physical pain, but also emotional pain. And all of us know what that's like in terms of emotional pain in our lives. Everyone here has not gone through this life uh, without some experience of pain. It's a universal experience, pain in our life. So for example... Couples who've experienced infertility, uh, their question is, will we ever be able to have kids? And the waiting, I've had friends who have gone through infertility, and the waiting is so painful. I mean, you do what you can and you pray, but in the end, through all of these kinds of things, you have to wait. There is a way. You cannot control things and just orchestrate things so that your life works out perfectly. For some singles, the question is, will I ever get married? And I have friends that have been single for, for years and years and who who long to get married, and, and, and we try and as the church, to, to, we want to value you as singles and not make you feel like you are less of a Christian because you're not married, remembering that Jesus himself and the Apostle Paul were single and, and godly and lived fulfilled lives in obedience to God. So, but sometimes in singleness, it's like, will I ever get married? Will God ever bring me this? And so there's a pain, there's a pain, especially around the holidays or maybe when your friends are getting together and your friends are having kids and you're thinking, I'm so far behind the curve or, the, or whatever the, the trajectory is that you thought you, that you were supposed to have. Or maybe for those with disease or debilitating conditions, it's, the question is, how long will I be able to deal with this? Will I ever recover from this? Will I die from this? The waiting is, is so painful. Or maybe in a broken marriage, uh, the question becomes, will this ever get better? I'm striving, I'm trying to do what I can, but it's so painful and it's so hard to wait through this and to, to wait on God and to see how this is going to work out. Will this ever get better? So my question for you this morning is, how do you deal with your pain in the waiting? And, and what should be, if you're a, a believer in Christ this morning, what should be your way of waiting? What does God's word call you to in the waiting as it relates to the pain in your life? 
And the message that Isaiah brings to the people of Israel in his day and the message that God would bring to us through Isaiah today is this. The big idea is wait patiently for God in your pain. Wait patiently for God in your pain. So Israel is a nation not huge in number and they're, they're getting harassed by the nations around them. Like I said in my opening prayer, there's sin in the life of, of the nation of Israel that's bringing consequences, God's judgment upon them and discipline upon them in some ways. And so there needs to be this encouragement to you because Isaiah is prophesying the kingdom of Assyria is going to come and destroy you and haul you off. Now how should you respond and, and, and wait in the middle of your pain as, as you wait on God? And so for us in our lives, as individuals and as the people of God, when we experience pain in our lives, what will be our response? And the call here today is to wait patiently for God in your pain. And so in these two chapters, Isaiah 25 and 26, Isaiah gives us two major motivations for waiting patiently for God in our pain. And the first motivation actually is a promise. Now specifically, I have to say this to be clear, this is specifically a promise to those who have trusted in God and in the Messiah, the Savior whom he, will, whom he sent, which is Jesus Christ. So there is a good promise for you. And so if you are not a person who has trusted in Christ as Savior, as, as the master of your life, then this morning is, is an invitation to you, is a call to you to put your hope in this one who, who gives hope and who can help you through your pain and gives you good promises. So here's the first motivation. And, and uh, I had a friend a couple weeks ago say, gosh, you were in your first point and we were already you know, down to the, when we were supposed to start the worship set. So just so you know, up front, the first point I'm going to spend the bulk of the time on so that you're not looking at your watch. Where's point two coming? So most of the time is point one here. So, um, so here's the first major idea, promise, motivation for how we should wait patiently for God in our pain. One day God will replace your pain with joy. This is something to cling to. This is something to hang on to. One day, God will replace all your pain with joy. The book of Isaiah is hard to understand. If you haven't watched the Join the Bible Project videos, there's there's two parts. I would highly recommend you do that. Just get on YouTube, search Join the Bible Project Isaiah, and and it takes you through the the structure of the book and and the major themes. It's super helpful. So the book of Isaiah oscillates between passages of judgment and hope. The first part of the book is mostly judgment with passages like this that are, that are mixed in with hope. Uh, and then the, the latter half of the book from chapters 40 on to the end is this major passages of hope and restoration. And so there's this oscillation of judgment and hope. God is going to judge rebellious nations and peoples who have rebelled against God. And in terms of hope and the, and the promises that he makes, he is going to send a future king, as we saw in the, in the most recent chapters 7 through 9, 11 and 12, a future king in the line of King David, uh, a Messiah, who will fulfill all of God's promises and bring God's reign of universal peace to the whole earth and bring his blessing to all the nations. So as we get into these chapters, Isaiah 25 and 26, there are two cities. There's what's called the lofty city, and then there's the the new Jerusalem, the heavenly city, Zion, where God will gather his people together. So the lofty city is the city that's raised itself up against God. And so this city represents kind of like what John's gospel uses the the term world to represent the human community living for its own interests, for its own purposes, with disregard for God and his purposes. That's the lofty city. It's it's a community of the world, so to speak. We don't need God. We're just doing our own thing. We're we're content in in technology and all of our achievements and the man-made things that that we create in this world. This is what our trust and our hope is in. We don't give a rip about God. Uh, We may believe that God exists, but for all intents and purposes, we're just living on our own, living life as people who are trusting in our own accomplishments, in our own strength, in our own wisdom. That represents the spirit of the world, the human community living in defiance against God. That's the lofty city in Isaiah. Now, the other city is the New Jerusalem, Mount Zion, where God is going to gather his people together. It's a picture of the final day when God ushers his people into the eternal city of God, into his presence, the New Jerusalem. So, we see here in Isaiah 25 too, you see the God, that God has judged the world in its corruption. So he says in verse 2, For you have made the city a heap, the fortified city a ruin. That's the lofty city. That's the city of the world. The lofty city felt secure. It felt fortified. It felt secure in its life apart from God. But ultimately, a life lived apart from a relationship with God through Jesus Christ is a life that ends in eternal ruin because you were made for God. And so to die apart from God is is your ultimate ruin. There's no life there. And so God is bringing down this lofty city. Now, but the needy and the poor, he says in verse 4, he says, uh, for you have been a stronghold to the poor, a stronghold to the needy in distress. So for the needy and the poor, 
God was better than a fortified city. A fortified city looks strong, but to the poor and the needy in distress, God is even stronger than a a humanly uh, created lofty city. He is a stronghold. So when you are in distress, when you are in pain, acknowledge yourself as being needy. And rather than trusting like the lofty city does in its own strength and its own power to take care of things and control life on your own apart from him, the call and the encouragement is to run to God because he is a stronghold. By way of comparison, your own wisdom and your own strength to deal with pain in your own life, whatever it is, is like a wobbly shack when God himself is a stronghold, Isaiah says. And then there's this great promise in verse 7. And he, that is God, will swallow up on this mountain, that is the city of God, the covering or the shroud, the veil that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He's talking about death. He is talking about the gloom of death that hangs over the world. Now, what does that mean? It means that no one on planet Earth is untouched by death. One day you will die. Someone you love will die. The gloom of death hangs over the world. But gloriously, then, verse verse 7 tells us God will remove the gloom of death that hangs over the world. Now, just two weeks ago, uh, this passage was on my mind. Very strongly so, because I went to the house of a, and visited a woman that I've gotten to know who has a terminal brain tumor. I think I've mentioned her in the past. So I found out just a couple of weeks ago, and it broke my heart, that they just recently stopped all treatment for her because the, the brain tumor has, cancer has become resistant to all treatment, and so she doesn't want to spend the remaining weeks or months of her life you know, feeling sick from the chemotherapy. So they took her off all medications, and they put her on hospice care. And so with two gals... Uh, that I know who are friends of hers, who are, who are followers of Jesus. We went over to her house, to this woman's house, to see her. And I'm praying, Lord, give me an opportunity to share, give me an opportunity to share some of this hope. And her family does not know the Lord. I've shared Christ with her a couple of other occasions. But her family doesn't know the Lord. And then her extended family, her sisters and her parents, uh, were in from out of state. They flew in because they know she's on hospice. So So they want to see her. I don't know if they're going to see her again. They're only there for about a week. So it wasn't exactly the setting in my mind that was ideal for having an intimate conversation and really being able to have like a heart-level conversation because we're sitting kind of small talking in this group of eight or nine people that I don't know and they don't know me. They know I'm a pastor and they know some of my history with with brain cancer. And uh, and I'm just praying, Lord, this feels so like out of place to just just open up and just start talking about Christ. Like, can you give me an in? And for an hour and a half, I'm praying to my spirit, Lord, would you... Open a door, give me a natural conversation in, and as time is going by, I, I, I keep waiting and, and nothing's coming. And I'm realizing I'm just going to have to say something. I'm just going to have to be bold. God, give me boldness. I don't want to alienate anyone. I don't want to turn them off, but I do want to get out of here having shared the hope of Jesus Christ. I don't know if I'm going to see her again, and I, and I don't get the sense that her family knows you or trusts in you, so I'm praying. I had thought about talking about um, John's gospel and the story of Lazarus. You know, though a man dies, yet if he believes in you, yet shall he live. And I didn't quite feel that that was right. So what came to me, what I felt like the Lord put upon my heart was the story of the thief on the cross, which is one of the most beautiful stories to me in all the Gospels because this criminal is there being executed and he acknowledges that he has done wrong, that he is justly being uh, condemned and executed for whatever the crimes were that he committed. And he says to the other guy who's hurling insults at Jesus, he said, well, look at us. We're getting crucified justly so for our, our deeds. This man has done nothing wrong. And so I took out my Bible and I read this story. So I said to them, I realized I wasn't going to be able to just have a natural conversation in with the gospel. So I had to get going. So I said, hey, I need to take off. But before I leave, it would be okay if I shared something. And they said, sure. And so I began, so what I did was I, I, the the gloom of death was just hanging, but no one was talking about it. Because it's hard. And and I'm sure they were when they they were there with just family and smaller settings. I'm sure they had their moments of grief and, and tears. But no one while we were there was talking about it. So I just said, I'm just, I just figured, I'm just going to call it out. I'm just going to acknowledge what's hanging in the air here. And so I said to her, I said, I know, this is really hard. Thank you for letting us be over here. I mean, I know they've taken you off all medications, and I know that, you know, that your life is going to end fairly soon. And I was hoping that that wasn't offensive, but I was just trying to say what was there, right? And so I said, I just want to share a message of hope with you. I've shared with you about Jesus before, and there's this scene that I would like to read to you, and I opened up the Gospel of Luke, and I said, here's a man, hang on. So I read the story, and I said, he looks to Jesus, and he acknowledges that he needs forgiveness, and he needs life. And I don't think this, this criminal had a very detailed, theologically informed view of who Jesus was. 
All we know that he knew was that Jesus was the king, the coming king that God had promised Israel. And he says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. So there's this implicit and this implied belief in life after death. There's this implied belief in resurrection that though Jesus was dying on the cross here as a king, he was going to live again and have a kingdom. I mean, how else can you read that? So the, so the, so the criminal says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus responds to him, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. And so I said to this woman, as I was, as I was sharing, I would just start crying. Like, not like choking up, but like crying to the point where she's, she's tearing up and she's grabbing Kleenex and giving it to me. And I'm like, why am I a mess? You know, and, and, her, sisters are, and her sisters are crying. And, uh, and I said, so the, so the hope is, the promise is that those who look to Jesus, even with just a little bit of faith, are, can be promised on that very day that though they die in this life, that they can live forever with him with full forgiveness, with full life, that this is the good news. Today you will be with me in paradise. I said, because God defeated death and conquered death when he raised Jesus bodily from the dead. And whoever confesses faith in this Jesus will live forever and receive forgiveness. So I cried and and they cried and then awkwardly I got up and I said, sorry for making an emotional scene. And they all gave me hugs, which was really interesting because they had just met me. And then I got in the car and I just broke. I just wept. Just wept. Because the gloom of death is hanging in the air. But I also simultaneously thank God for this promise. That though none of us go untouched, unscathed from death, there is this hope that God will one day swallow up death. And that there is life that is offered through his king, through Jesus. And then verse 8 reiterates this promise. He will swallow up death forever. Forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. Now, if you've ever cried, why do you cry? What what are tears the result of? Tears are the result of pain. All kinds of pain. The pain of disappointment, the pain of loss. Whatever you lose in your life can cause pain. The, The pain of separation, the pain of death. That's what causes tears. And this promise is that God will wipe tears from all faces. Would you note that it doesn't just say that God will remove tears by this divine act of of omnipotent power. Yes, he is omnipotent in power, but that's not the language that's used here. It's very personal. It's very intimate. The Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. Now, sometimes when my daughters cry, I take my thumbs and and I wipe their tears off their cheeks and I say, oh, honey, I know, I'm sorry, it's hard. And it's a very intimate act, an expression of love as a father for me to wipe their tears from their cheeks. And the picture of God here is if you know Jesus Christ and if you know the life that's in him, then God, as your loving heavenly Father, whom you need, will one day wipe all the tears with his thumbs, so to speak, from your face. And you will never produce tears again. Maybe tears of joy, but not tears that come from pain. And that's the promise. Pain will never bring tears to your eyes again. Now listen again to verse 9. It will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in our salvation. Now you may be here this morning and you say, I believe there's a God. I believe in God. Have you been able to say, can you say, this is our God. This is my God. There's a difference between saying there is a God and he is my God. Do you see that? And this is very personal. This is, he is our God. This is our Lord. Let us be glad and rejoice in our salvation. It's not impersonal. It's not a concept. It's not far out there. And I believe there's a God. No, I believe in my God. And I will rejoice in my salvation. And so what's happening here in verse 9 is the people of God are saying, finally, we have waited for God to show up. We have waited for God to deliver us from all our pains, from all our struggles. And he's finally showed up. And he's... He's taken away all our pain and he's replaced it with joy. God has put everything right again. God is with us. God is with his people. And now there's joy. The longer you wait for God in your pain, I know this life can feel very long to you, especially for those of you with chronic pain, whether it's in your body or it's a chronic grief that's been a part of your heart for many years from losing someone, losing a relationship, whatever it is, life can feel so long. But in the, in the breadth of eternity, in the scope of eternity, life is a blip. The Bible says over and over, our life is like a vapor. It's like a, it's like a mist. It's like the, the, the flower that springs up in the morning and then gets burned up. It just passes, the, it withers 
like the grass as the heat passes over. Our life is very short, so it feels long and it feels painful. But the longer you wait for God in the middle of your pain, then the greater your joy when he finally removes it. The longer you wait for God in your pain, the greater your joy when he finally removes it. Now, like in the case of uh, an imprint couple here, I talked with them this, I chatted with them this week, um, Andy and Lauren Freeman, some of you guys know them. They, they dealt with, and they said it was okay to, to, to name them by name because I was just going to keep it, you know, anonymous, although a lot of people know who they are in the church. For years, they struggled with infertility. It was just a, just a pain and a brokenness in their heart. Their pain was deep and their pain was long. If you guys know them, then recently you know that God gave them a miracle. He gave them twin boys. And now it is such a joy. It's amazing to watch them as parents. You know, most people like freak out when they have twins because like, how am I going to even live? And it's like, they're just taking everything in stride and they're just overflowing with joy. And what they told me this last week when I talked to them about it is that they said that their joy in this miracle gift that God gave them far exceeds the pain of their waiting. And I know that can be so hard when you're in pain to go, oh yeah, I know that. I've heard people say that, that joy one day will replace my morning. Joy comes in the morning. We just sang The point is not that God will always give you what you long for, provided you wait long enough. Sometimes God does, but sometimes he doesn't. Some people die in their waiting. Some people die in their pain. Sometimes he does give us in this life the thing that we have waited for and longed for, and then we find that our joy exceeds the pain of the waiting. But the point is this. The point is there will be a future joy that far exceeds your present pain. There will be a future joy that far exceeds your present pain. If it doesn't happen in this life, it will happen in the next. The Apostle Paul wrote this in Romans 8, 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that is to be revealed to us. Let me read it again. I consider the sufferings of the present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. So he is talking about the future resurrection of the body of the saints who are in Christ and the new heavens and the new earth. That's his hope. And he's a man who suffered. And Isaiah, did you know, prophesies about the future joy of resurrection in a similar way. He says that the future joy of the resurrection will outstrip your present pain, is what he says. In Isaiah 26, 19, he says, Your dead shall live, their bodies shall rise. You who dwell in the dust, awake and sing for joy. Awake and sing for joy, for you do as the dew of light, and the earth will give birth to the dead. If you love and trust in God and in his Savior Jesus, you will be resurrected to glory one day. And resurrection means this. It means God will unite your spirit. You have a spirit inside you. You are a, 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 dual, a dual being in the sense that you have a, a material element to you and an immaterial element to you. And some people divide it up differently, but there's immaterial and there's material. There's the physical body, the flesh that you have, and then there's the spirit that you have. And on the day of resurrection, if you are in Christ, then you will be raised to glory. God will rejoin your spirit to a new glorified body like the one that Jesus has. And if you are not in Christ, and the, the Bible says, and this is, the, this is the judgment piece that I have to say as, as a proclaimer of God's word, the judgment piece is that you will be resurrected to condemnation. You will be resurrected to judgment. You will also have a body uh, eternally, and, and you will be subject to, to, to separation from God, which is complete alienation and desolation of soul. And, and that's the hard news. I, I don't like it, but that's, the, that's part of the news. It's part of what makes the gospel of salvation, the good news of salvation in Jesus is so good, is that God will take you if you are in Christ and he will raise you up and he will join your spirit to a new glorified body like the one that Jesus has. And there are so many implications of the doctrine of the resurrection that we could talk about. Let me just mention a few of them that the New Testament speaks of in terms of resurrection. And the first is this, is that, is that you can grieve the death of loved ones in Christ, but not grieve as those who have no hope. First Thessalonians 4 says, I've done memorial services for both Christians and non-Christians. There is a deep grieving at both. If you lose someone, it is good and right and appropriate to grieve. But if they're in Christ and you know that they're, that they're with him, then you don't grieve without hope as the world grieves. I've, I've done memorial services for Christians and non-Christians. There's grief at both of them. But I will tell you there is a distinct and palpable difference at the memorial service or the funeral of a Christian who's passed away. Deep grief, but there's also a palpable hope because of resurrection. So Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 4, we, we can grieve, but not as those who have no hope in the world. Now, one of the other implications is that not only will your body be transformed and no longer be subject to death and decay, but your heart will be fully transformed. Forevermore, you will love God and others perfectly. 
you will have no more impulses toward wrongdoing like you do today. Now, isn't that one of the most awesome and freeing and wonderful things that you won't struggle anymore to fight the selfishness, to fight the lust, to fight the greed, to fight the, 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 the desire for, for accolades and for, for people to pat you on the back and think that you're the best. And you won't have any inclination toward that. You will freely love God and others for all of eternity. Now, the last implication that I'd like to mention, the third one, is that everything you do for the Lord matters. Everything that you do for him, every single little thing that you do matters. Even if you can't see the effect in this life, it has an effect that ripples into eternity. So Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 gives this long treatise on resurrection, theology. And the the way that he concludes this long section on the resurrection is with this practical application that everything you do for the Lord in this life matters. He says this in 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. So what you do in this life now to serve Christ is of eternal significance, whether or not you see that in the moment, whether or not you see the effect today. Because what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 is that if there's no resurrection and if you just die and your body goes to the grave and that's it, lights out, and that's the end of your existence, then he says ultimately there's no point to your life. He says let's eat and drink and be merry for tomorrow we die. Because there's nothing that lasts beyond the grave. There's no lasting significance. There's no point to your life. But because there is a resurrection, therefore everything you do for the Lord in this life matters whether you're on stage or or off the stage behind the scenes, it it, it doesn't matter. There is lasting significance in the kingdom of God for all your work that you do. So he says nothing nothing that we do is in vain. So if you pray for someone, it matters to God. If you greet someone when they come through the door on a Sunday morning, it matters to God. If you change a diaper in the nursery, it matters to God. It matters to God. I'm so glad my kids are out of diapers, but man, it it matters to God. Now, that's the first package. That's the, that's the first piece of God will replace our pain with joy. That's one of our major motivations for waiting patiently for God in our pain. The second is this, is that God is your only dependable source of strength and peace. And we find this in chapter 26. God is your only dependable source of strength and peace. So God's people are, are facing pain in this life, both Israel and us today in, in, in various forms. And so the question becomes then, how am, I supposed to wait? how am I supposed to wait for God? We've waited for God. How can you wait patiently for God in light of the suffering, in light of the pain? Isn't it easy in your pain to let your fears run wild with all the what ifs, all the anxieties, all the worries? Well, I'm in pain. What if this pain doesn't go away and I'm single? What if I never get married? Um, what if I never get over this grief for the loss of a, lo- of a loved one? What if we never have kids? Whatever your pain is, it's easy to let your fear take over, to dominate your thinking. And let your fear and your imagination run wild in the wrong direction. So how is it possible? Uh, What should you do as you wait for God in your pain? And the answer is this, is keep your thoughts fixed on God. Keep your thoughts fixed on God. Verse 3 says this, You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord God is an everlasting rock. God alone has the power to keep you in perfect peace. Now, if we had it our way, we would be able to control all our circumstances. But we can't. If we, if we could, then we'd probably be God, right? We're not God. And frustratingly, we can't control all of our emotions. Anxiety and worry is one of the, and fear is one of the most uh, hard to control emotions. It's not like you can just command yourself to stop worrying. It's, it's very hard to do that, right? So you may not be able to control your circumstances. You may not be able to control your emotions. But what you can control is where you direct your thoughts. And then you give that, you, you direct your thoughts toward God and you allow him to be the one. Notice it's God who is able to keep you in perfect peace. You cannot keep yourself in perfect peace. But God can. Because it says this, uh, that he is an everlasting rock in verse 3, right? He's an everlasting rock. We sang about that. He is the rock. The rock doesn't move. That is to say, he is for your life a sure foundation. In a word, he's dependable. I heard this phrase I really like, solidly dependable. God is solidly dependable. Are you convinced that God is solidly dependable? And because he is dependable, Isaiah says, almost like the psalmist, a psalmist in verse 9, he says, my soul yearns for you in the night. See, if you yearn for peace, to be freed from fear and anxiety in the middle of all your pain, 
then yearn for God, not just peace. Yearn for the God of peace, the God who gives peace. Isaiah says, my soul yearns for you in the night. My spirit within me earnestly seeks you. So how are you supposed to wait patiently for God in your pain? Well, you realize he's the only dependable source of peace and security in this life, and you seek him. You fix your mind on him. You know, uh, computers and phones and electronic devices, they come with factory default settings, do they not? So there are certain settings that you can go in and you can just... Uh, and if you, you know, get a new phone or whatever, or you buy a phone from somebody, you can choose to reset all the factory default settings. There's the default mode, what it will normally go to. Do you know that your mind as a human being, its default mode is not to think about God. By nature, even as a, a person saved by grace, if you are in Christ, still your default mode is, is to think about yourself. And it's to trust in your own resources, your own powers, your own wisdom, the own, your own way of orchestrating life so that you can fix your pain. And to be sure, I'm not of the philosophy, nor is the Bible of the philosophy, let go and let God, like we are just passive observers in a life of following Jesus. That no, yet you are active and you seek God, so there's an active participation. But in terms of where your default thinking should go, it should go to God. So I think what we need to do, if we're going to listen to this, is we need to develop a God-centered default setting of our minds. So that when you wake up, so that when you're driving on 405, when you get a quiet break, a moment in the middle of the day, your mind goes to God. Now, fortunately, by God's grace, as, as I've grown more in my Christian faith, I, I remember uh, when I first became a Christian, there'd be times when I'd wake up and I, I'd be like, wow, it's noon. I haven't thought about God once. I haven't thought about God once since I've woken up. And as I've walked with Christ now, now he's the first thing I think, and this is not a boast, this is just to say this is what God does when you develop a habit of setting your mind and trying to make the default of your mind be him. So now that I have this good, fresh-smelling Bible I told you guys about last week, let's get up early in the morning, and by God's grace, I've never been a morning person, and by his grace now, I don't know, maybe it's just getting older. I'm like, I can't, I wake up earlier in the morning, I can't fall back asleep, you guys know what I'm talking about? So I'm like, well, if I'm going to wake up early and I can't fall back asleep, I might as well just get up and make myself some coffee and, and set my mind on him. And so learning to develop a habit of, of of, of resetting your factory default settings and customizing them. So customize the default settings of your mind so that they naturally default to God. Now, how do you do that? Well, you develop a habit of getting into the Bible for yourself, not just podcasts. Now, I listen to podcast sermons when I'm driving and they're helpful, but that cannot replace what God does to meet with you when you are there in front of his word. That is where you need to be, not just relying on what other people are giving to you, but hopefully in your time with God that you, are, that you are there with him. So number one, develop a habit of getting into the Bible for yourself, meeting with God for yourself. And secondly, I would say get with people who are serious about their relationship with Jesus Christ. Because when you get with people who love Jesus and take his word seriously, there is an effect that happens. They will pour strength into your life that you don't have that will help reset and customize the settings in your mind to help you default toward thinking about God. That's what he does through the nature of, of the Christian community. So in closing, what is painful in your life right now and what are you waiting on God for? Remember the gospel. Paul says this to Timothy a bunch of times in his second letter to Timothy. It's like, what, is he going to forget the gospel? Yeah, we are prone to forget the gospel. So in your pain and in your sorrow and as you think about death and the loss of things in life, then remember the gospel that Jesus experienced pain and death on the cross in order to save you from pain and death that your own sins brought upon you. So you remember the gospel, and then you fix your thoughts, you fix your mind on God, knowing that he alone can keep you in perfect peace, and then cling to the promise that one day, one day, he will replace all your pain with everlasting joy. And that comes through Jesus. So let's pray in his name right now to that end. God, we so need you. We realize that we are frail and needy people. We are like those who Isaiah 25 describes as, as the poor and needy who are in distress, who run to God, who is a stronghold. God, our own wisdom, our own minds, our own strength and resources, compared to you, uh, we're just a wobbly shack destined for ruin. But you are a stronghold, God, a, a refuge for us. And I thank you for this promise that one day you will swallow up death. And I pray for my, my brothers and sisters here and for whatever the pain is causing the tears to come to their eyes, that they would fix their mind, their hope, fully on Jesus Christ, the hope that is to be revealed in the last day when you will gather your people to yourself and you will take your hands as our loving Father 
and you will wipe the tears from our cheeks and there will be no more pain that will ever bring tears to our eyes again. And I pray that we would, with the Apostle Paul, say that even our sufferings today, though painful and agony, can even be turned into a glory. That in some way, as C.S. Lewis said, you're going to work backwards and turn even agony into glory. And so, God, would you help those who are in pain today, those who are in the waiting, to fix their hope on the promise that you will replace their pain with joy and that they will look to you as their only dependable source of peace in this life, God. So give it to them, I pray. All in Christ's name. Amen.